Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. If you like this podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you take just a few minutes and leave a review for me on iTunes. It is super easy to do, and it makes the podcast easier for other people to find. Plus, it helps me get so many of these great guests that you hear on the show. So all you need to do is go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash review. That page has a direct link to iTunes where you can leave your review. It would mean so much to me, and I thank you in advance for that. The Savvy Painter podcast is published every week on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, and SoundCloud. If you are a painter or artist who is looking for down-to-earth, real-life conversations about art, how to create it, how to sell it, you are in the right place. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community, you will be inspired to create, and you'll hear real stories from artists who are thriving with their art. So if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you to the Savvy Painter community. But make sure you don't miss an episode. Sign up for weekly updates, free guides, and workshop announcements. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on Join. It's that easy. Now let's get started. My guest this week is Nathan Lewis. Nathan is a narrative painter originally from Northern California. Nathan received his BFA from the Lyme Academy and his MFA from Tufts University and the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. He also studied at the Florence Academy of Art in Italy and in St. Petersburg, Russia. He is currently a tenured associate professor at Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut, and is represented by the Fernanda Luis Alvarez Gallery. In this episode, Nathan and I talk about the language of painting. We talk about learning form, composition, and why Nathan needed to teach himself how to construct multi-figure paintings to better tell stories with his art. We also get into a conversation about painting through frustration and doubt and trusting the process which supports your way out of insecurities and fears surrounding painting. And in a conversation about his process, Nathan also shares how he chooses a motif and describes how he sees light in a new way after working on a series of abandoned factories. With that series, Nathan dug into capturing the feeling of the space in addition to just an accurate drawing or painting of it. And this leads us into a discussion on using memory photographs and why studio painting serves Nathan so well. So without further ado, here is Nathan Lewis. Nathan, thank you very much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm excited to talk to you. I'm excited to talk to you as well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what kind of work you do. For people who haven't seen your work before, I'm kind of curious how you would describe it. There are a few genres I play with. I definitely am interested in narrative art. I have a background in figuration, strong degree of naturalism, realism, however you want to call that. But my roots are in that. But I'm very interested in stories and ideas and history, literature. And so I I try to find ways to sort of get that in the work. Mm -hmm. Nice. I'm also curious how you got started as an artist. I know that's kind of a question that gets, that's like the the first question that everybody asks. Tell me like, when did you start drawing? And it's usually, well, you know, when I was like five years old, which is when we start drawing. So (laughs) it makes sense. I, I definitely drew a bit, but I got somewhat of a late start to art probably around when I was 20. That's when I started thinking this is an option. And I started getting more serious about it. I definitely drew. I did some creative things. I was heavily into the BMX scene. I'm from Northern California and there's a big skate BMX scene. Oh yeah. And I sort of came up through that. And I had a a bunch of friends in Sacramento. I, I built like a half pipe in my backyard and And then I started making like a little zine, a little magazine runoff on a Xerox copier. Uh And I drew the pictures. I took the pictures. I wrote the stories and that. So I wasn't necessarily thinking in terms of art, but there was definitely like a creative drive there. Mm -hmm. And I think from making the zine, that sort of pushed me into photography. And I studied that for two years somewhat seriously. And then... I took some art classes 
And I came across one professor at Sac City College, Fred Dalkey. Mm -hmm. He's a really good draftsman, really good painter. And I think it was about that time I started thinking, hey, you know, this is a possibility. And once that happened, then I was pretty serious. I just sort of put all my energy towards that, started going to museums and galleries, and pretty much that's where I am. So what was it about that experience that made you think that this is a possibility? Was there anything? I mean, do you, I'm just I'm always curious about that. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. When I look back, I don't know if I had this sense when it happened. But one of the things that he would do, he taught figure drawing and portrait drawing. He taught painting, too, but I took mostly the drawing classes from him. He would draw in class along with the students. So he was I could see how, how good his drawings were. And I could see that he was doing the same thing I was doing, except my drawings weren't very good. So there was something about that common experience. But the other thing he would do would, would be to take us in and show us slides. And he'd show us a range from contemporary artists. I mean, he's good friends with Wayne Tebow. He knows all the artists in California. But he would show us slides from the Renaissance, like Filipino Lippi or Hans Holbein or Tiepolo or Rembrandt. He would show these slides. And I could see from his work, I could see, hey, he's connected to this from, from his drawings. There's a, there's a strong tie, I would say, to Dutch painting and drawing. There's a, a strong ties to Rembrandt, but also 19th century French, like a Proudhon sort of drawing. Uh -huh. So I could see the connection between him and history. And I could see the connection between me and him because we were both drawing in the same class. So I think metaphorically, there was a connection between me and history or me and what was going on in the museums. I think when I look back on that, whether I was aware of that or not, that was a very important moment for me because it meant that things in history were not these old things on walls. They were these living, breathing entities, and they were evidence of these artists that lived throughout time trying to make sense of the things that they saw. So. I think that was a very, very powerful experience for me that's sort of, you know, still unfolding. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that just that sense of the lineage and that we are all in this together. I always kind of think of it as like there's this massive river, which is art, and we're all these little trickles or tributaries coming in from different directions, adding to it. It's interesting because sometimes I hear people say things like, oh, all the all the great art has already been done, or there's so many amazing artists out there, what could I possibly contribute to it? And I just always have that vision of this river with these little bits of water coming in. And if we turn them all off, then it all dries up. And so that it always scares me in some way, like, because I have this visual, this strong visual of it, when people say things like that. But I'm kind of curious, what got you... I don't want to say what got you into the narrative painting, because I kind of feel like, you know, with your zine, it makes sense that you were interested, to me, at least, it feels like you were interested in communication, and you ended up choosing the visual path for that. But I'm kind of curious from your own reflection, what was it that drew you to the narrative style of painting? I think representational painting, there's such a, a learning curve in becoming competent. And I think it's it's related to observation and it's related to form a lot. I think form is probably what's taught the most in representational schooling. And it's, you know, it's very important. You have to, you have to put hours and hours and hours in to sort of understand how to approach it. So I think that was such a chore in the beginning. I, I wasn't really thinking too much about the other stuff. But I think from the beginning to me, art was maybe perhaps because I felt I came late to it, it was always tied to the pursuit of trying to find meaning in life. It wasn't just, I don't feel like I was born a painter. I definitely feel like it's in my temperament. There are certain things I'm good at, but I don't feel like I was just born to paint and that sort of thing. So I, the, the attraction to art was also an attraction to trying to live a life of meaning and, and find some way to interact with this world. So I think that's more of a philosophical idea based 
approach. Mm -hmm. And I think my attraction to narrative is sort of tied in with that. Mm -hmm. I think once I had studied for 10 years or so, going to different schools and, and felt like I was, at least I understood the principles of observation enough to continue to build that on my own. I think the trying to figure out what I wanted to to say or do started to come up more. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I, I channeled so much just into trying to be able to paint form well that the other part of me, the part that's interested in stories and ideas, and you know, I love literature and philosophy and scripture and religions and stuff like that. I'm very interested in that stuff. So I think spending so much time just concentrating on form after 10 years, it's just like, oh my God, I, you know, I've got to be telling these stories. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is that it's not always taught how to do narrative pieces or multi-figure compositions. And, you know, I, I went to a number of schools and I was sort of frustrated that it wasn't taught. So I think you spend so much time looking for someone else to teach you to do something. And at some point you have to sort of say, you know, fuck it, I'm going to try it on my own and fail miserably. And mm -hmm. it's in that failing that you sort of figure out what you should have done. I, you know, I think that's what painting's about, doing things the wrong way and then realizing, oh, I should have done it this way. But that sort of continuum that you're building up, every time that you're holding a brush, every time that you're creating an image, there's a part of you that remembers that. And so you're sort of building this vocabulary of communication, of marks, of understanding of, of the substance of paint, the support, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a natural process, but I think because I was struggling so hard to paint realistically, I wasn't working on the other parts of what my interests are. And yeah. then it really sort of came to the forefront and then I'd sort of go back and forth. And I, I still sort of go through waves. I do pieces that are much more narrative driven. And then I do pieces that are more about maybe a little less narrative, more related to the power of an object or a particular scene. Mm -hmm. It's less about what's happening between the people. And it's more about just the, the power of the image. Right, right. Yeah, that's really, there's a couple of things I think are, are interesting about what you just said. And just an observation that I think that you made that I think is very, very true that is often overlooked, which is, you know, you could spend about a decade working just on form and really learning how to, you know, in your case, draw the figure and put it into an environment. And then there's the physicality of the paints. And so like all of these things matter and add up. And then eventually you do get to that point where like, okay, I have this vocabulary. How am I going to use it? What am I going to say with it? And the, the other thing that, and, and I think because of that, because learning the form is so difficult and it takes so much time to me, it's not hours and hours to me. It's like, it's like a decade at least to, to start to kind Absolutely. of understand it. Yeah. I think it's still, you continue to learn even, yeah. you know, even after decades, you're still figuring those things out. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I think for that reason, it's kind of, I understand it, but it makes me really sad that in a lot of the schools that even do teach figurative work, multi-figurative work, they just don't even, most don't even touch it. I know there's there's a couple that do, but it's such an important, it's so sad because we're losing like the ability to create these massive works of art that, you know, like those those historical pieces that are just so relevant and so beautiful. I'm curious when you decided to really focus on that piece of your skill set doing multifigurative work, how did you teach yourself to do it? What were you looking at? I you know, I think museums are the are the great source for everything. You're looking at the history of painting and and there's such amazing work in museums and in books, but I don't I don't really know how you start. You you just sort of want to do this thing and then you realize that it's not going to get done unless you try. And so you try something and uh, again, it, usually you fail miserably, but then you start to understand what you know and what you don't know. Even even in painting and form, there are all sorts of things that I realize, well, yeah, maybe this is what that teacher was trying to teach me and I thought I knew it, but I I really didn't know it. Mm -hmm. So I think there has to be a sort of desperation or a need to create a certain type of image and that will pull you. It'll also teach you 
in terms of what you need to know and, and, and where your weak points are. What don't you know? Why are you so miserable in this particular area? But it's a lot easier to not do it and sort of dream about the paintings that you want to make mm-hmm. and never really know where you're falling short. You really have to sort of get in there and get your hands dirty, fail miserably. Yeah. To, to know what it is that you need to do. But I, you know, I, th- I think it comes from need mostly sense of desire, sense of sort of following that and then being okay in the process of failing and yeah. learning from that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's critical. A lot of times I, you know, my personal opinion is that when you really want to do something and something about it scares you or that, you know, all these fears that come up with artists, the fear of failure, the fear of, I think the fear of failure can kind of wrap up almost all of it (laughs) because it's just, you know, I don't want to look stupid. I don't, you know, like whatever it is that's running through our minds or when you say it out loud, it just all of that stuff just sounds ridiculous when you put it next to this is the thing I want to do. So I think what happens is, you know, and what happened with you, it sounds like is your desire to do this was stronger than any of the fears that you had. And I think oftentimes, like when you kind of like, just right now, it's trying to think back on all of the things that scare me or that stop me from doing something. When you say it out loud, it's just like, what that that is the thing that's going to stop me from doing it that's just insane (laughs) Mm -hmm. so i really love that were you you know speaking of that you've mentioned getting past this fear of failure multiple times in the sense that you just have to kind of push through it or it's something that you will not allow you it sounds like you're adamantly not allowing that thing to get in your way no, I I think it always gets in the way. It's always there. It's not like I don't have a fear a fear of failure. It's always there. I I have a terrible fear of failure. It's just that I think that's the given. And I think if you're familiar enough with failure, and I think the painting process does this for you. If you force yourself to paint, even when you don't want to, if you're in the studio, things can turn around pretty quickly. I can go into the studio not wanting to paint, hating it. An hour later, something opens up, your mind is sparked, you're, <laughs> you're completely in bliss in the zone, and you know you, you sort of follow that. I think that's where that paying your dues really comes in, is that you have to go through those cycles to realize that the process will support all of your insecurities, and it will support the way out of those, it'll support the... It's, you really have to invest in the process. If you're going to do anything with any sort of an art form, you have to be willing to go in there, you know, and do it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean like there's no way I've conquered failure or doubt or any of that. I, I have tremendous doubt, tremendous fear. I fail all the time, but Ultimately, if I don't do it, I'll, I'll get bored or I'll get very antsy and uh-huh. it'll eventually make me go in there and start fiddling around with it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's the it's the most obvious solution that we tend to ignore is the only way out of it or through it is maybe it's the only way through it is a better way to put it. But the only way through it is to paint your way through it. There's really no other way <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was there was uh, interesting. I have a couple of friends, Chris Joy and Zach Keating, and they do a lot of studio visits videos. And they did one with Leonard Anderson. And I think he, they did a couple with him. I can't remember which one it was, but he was telling them the solution to a painting that is overworked is more work. <laughs> that the only way that you're going to fight your way out of this thing that's failing for some reason is to put more work in on it. But that was it was funny because you know people complain about paintings being overworked. Well, what do you do with that? You put in more work. Put in more work. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> that must have been an amazing experience for them to be able to talk with him. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about how you choose your motif. It's really changed a bit, and it can happen in a number of ways. It could be from something I'm reading, could be a scenario, could be a narrative that intrigues me. And then I try to think of what that would look like visually in a, in a painting. It could be, there have been different series I've worked with. There was one 
with a, a motif of a tower and everything I did for maybe five years had this tower in it. And then a more recent series were these abandoned factories that I got really intrigued with and was sort of sneaking into them. But the origin of a painting can happen in a number of ways. It can happen visually. I've seen like an image in a newspaper that intrigued me and then wanted to work with that. It's been from a story I remember reading Jerzy Kosinski's The Painted Bird and the little narrative sequence that the title came from mm -hmm. was very powerful. I ended up doing a painting about that. It can be from an object. It can be from a, a setting. I think with the factories, I had always snuck into factories when I was younger. The sort of I, I, empty spaces were interesting. You know, they aren't serving any more function. And most recently with the series, when I was going in, what was very intriguing was the what the light was doing in this spaces. We're used to seeing light through architecture, even in like a factory setting. But so many of these factories were collapsing because of disuse and snow and fire that the way that the light got into the space was unusual. So you had light coming through a window, but then you might have the sunlight hitting through a hole in the roof, beaming mm -hmm. down to where I was looking at light as an entity in itself again. I think artists, particularly representational artists, that are so much, so interested in light and looking at it and trying mm. to understand it and going into these spaces because of the unusual mix between nature and architecture, the experience of light was making me think of it as an entity. And, you know, it is an entity, but we mm -hmm. tend to take it for granted or we tend to see a particular direction of light and right. know how to approach that. So this experience was very sort of exciting. Yeah. But then the challenge of the spaces itself, I had been working with figures for so long that the painting process changed dramatically. I just felt like I don't know what I'm doing. I, I can't, I'm a terrible painter. I can't do this. So it was a real struggle to, to understand the type of marks or, or what to do with the, the actual substance of paint, with the value structure, with the type of marks. Yeah. I ended up doing all sorts of things that I never would do before. I ended up like sharpening the, the end of a paintbrush. In these factories, there are a lot of like little dust particles. Yeah. And painting them with the tip of the brush, even though it looked like a photo reference that I'm looking from, it didn't feel like the space. So that's was sort of telling me, you need to do something with this medium, with these colors, with this palette, with this, to make it feel like you're in that space. So the strategy changed in the way that I would approach it. It was, it was a different space, a different sort of environment, a different type of light. Yeah. So the type of marks, the type of paint, the thickness of the paint changed. Also the, the structure, the value structure, there were a lot of very dark tones, you know, if you're looking at a value range from one to 10, there was a lot within like the eight to 10 range uh -huh. and trying to have those areas of the painting read as space. Yeah. And not just like this flat darkness that. Yeah. 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 I, mm -hmm. I, I really had to explore a lot with different colors. I was using a lot of colors with really strong tinting strengths that were darker, you know, phthalos and quinacridones and dioxazine, those sort of things. And, and really trying to charge these lower registers. Yeah. So when you're in front of the painting, even if you can't tell the color is there because it's such a dark value, you can feel the differences. There's vibration within the darks. Yeah. 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 I learned a hell of a lot from that. So, I mean, that was a, that was an instance where in terms of a motif, thinking about a setting before thinking about a figure. Yeah. I think it was a lot about that. And it was like trying to understand a new structure. I'm talking more like a idea sort of motif. Visually, if, if you're talking like a visual motif, I'm not sure where you were leading with that. I tend to, in these factories, I, t I take a lot of pictures. I, I work from photography a lot. I take my own photography. I tend to go through the images that I've taken. Mm -hmm. And the ones that sort of strike me as unusual or I don't know what it is, but I can, I can I'm getting like a charge from it. When you look at the pictures, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Compositionally, when mm -hmm. I'm looking at the, the sort of layout, you know, that's a sort of another sort of motif. 
in terms of framing. I, you know, I think composition is probably the most effective way to communicate psychologically to someone. They don't always know what's happening, but they feel it. When you see the arrangement within a rectangle or a circle, whatever it is that you're working with, it's a very powerful experience. And I think for me, there are compositions I, I understand, or they make me think of other compositions, mm -hmm. but there are also ones that make me feel uneasy or awkward. And I usually try to go towards those um, because I don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. And I, I think if you're going to progress, you have to be very comfortable with the unknown and like trying to figure out, you know, to sort of go out from that. So yeah, the visual motif, if you were referring to that happens more on that level, a little more psychological. I can't necessarily articulate it. Yeah. But when I'm looking at it, there's like a psychological charge or there's a sort of questioning, what is this or what could it be? You know, those, those two things are, are really important to me. And are you, I'm curious, are you, there's so much to unpack with what you said. I love it. Um, <laughs> so I'm kind of curious because you've, you've, mentioned a couple of things that I think are really, really interesting. So that charge that you get, just out of curiosity, are you experiencing that when you're in the environment or later on when you're looking at the photos in terms of the composition? So when I was asking about the motifs, I think both of your answers are exactly dead on because there are those two aspects of it. But in terms of your experience of selecting that place... Is there a difference between being there and then seeing the photographs later and going, wow, this one is making me uncomfortable. I'm not really sure why. Or did you experience that while you were in the environment? I think you're always experiencing it. The possibilities are there at every stage of, a, of an image. So you're using your knowledge and your experience. And sometimes you go in with preconceived ideas, like you know you want certain things. So I'll do those, but you're still there. So you start exploring these other other things. And yeah, you're you're sort of responding to the things that excite you. But there's always a difference between the original experience and then experiencing it again. So mm -hmm. if you're if you're dealing with photography, there's the experience of being in the space and what you're feeling about that space. There's the framing. What are you putting in? What aren't you? There's the controlling of the lighting. And then when you are viewing it on a computer it's somewhat removed from that yeah. experience and you're seeing it in a new venue. Right. You know, it's just like a, a painting that you do in your studio. If it's in a show along other people's, it changes the dynamic of how you read that painting, just being in a separate space, different light on it, the size of the walls, all of that's happening. So it happens at every step of the stage of producing an image. I think in the painting process, that's where it can sort of break down. If you're working from a, a photograph, does it, become a painting or does it just sort of stay a representation of what's in the photo? And, mm -hmm. th and that's where it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like it didn't, wasn't feeling like I was in the space or I wasn't able initially in the painting to experience what my draw was to that sort of a space. So that's where really thinking about your actions in this studio, the type of brush you use, the palette knife, the thickness of the paint, the colors, the canvas, all of those things, that's where you make or break. You know, that's ultimately, that's why we look at paintings. Yeah. Because yeah. they're mysterious. You yeah. Know, they're, 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 there's all that that's sort of going on. You're looking at the surface, this sort of skin, you're looking at an image, you're experiencing space, you're reading the mind of the, the artist that made that, you know, all those things are happening. And you can usually tell when it's not working. So you got to you got to figure out why it's not working or you got to stab in the dark and, and try things until it is starting to work. Right, right. One component that we haven't talked about, but I have a feeling plays into your work is the I'm curious, how much does memory play into what you do when you're translating photograph? to a canvas, because it feels like you experience this place. And it resonates a lot with me because I, you know, there's some similarities in, in how we work. And for example, I paint a lot of glaciers and, and they come from places that I've been. And so there's the experience of being there in front of this massive 
block of ice and what that feels like and what that, you know, everything that comes with that. And then I bring it back and it's on a screen and it, trying to get that power and, you know, like all, all of those things that, that you're talking about. And so I'm curious when you're, there's always that, you know, when you take a picture, there's so much that's left out, obviously. And mm-hmm. you are aware of that as the photographer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, there are things that photography does that I like that it takes information out that it flattens it out, that you're losing information. There are certain characteristics of photography that I'm very drawn to visually, Mm -hmm. even, and I think translate beautifully into paint. So it's not a, I'm not worried about a lack of information. I do think memory plays into it, but it, it really changes depending on the type of piece I'm doing. I think with the factory series, there was something very important about the setting, the actual places. So the memory of that space and the sense of air or the sense of existing in that space plays a pretty big role. There are other pieces where it doesn't play a role at all, where I'm just trying to get these things. They're more like a a Barbie set or little dolls that I'm putting on this stage to try to do something that I want. Mm -hmm. So the thing that I want may not be in existence. It may not be an actual space. Yeah. And these little play things, a photograph could be about, you know, 300 things, but I'm using it for this one thing. Yep. And I like the power of, of that. I really do enjoy working from life and that's the way I I train, you know, I spent hours and hours and I, I still do that. I'm working on a figure drawing right now. That's probably at like the 30 hour mark, but I always find when I'm in front of a person I'm so conscious of their personality, their environment, and that it's this sort of give and take between those two things. As a maker and as a composer and as uh, someone that is fascinated with the imagination, I don't always want that. I don't always want that involvement. I don't want that infringing. I would much rather have these little fragment things that I can make whatever I want. And I can concentrate more on this idea or this imagining and this little photograph serves perfectly well because I can just choose the things that I want from it. If I'm in front of a person, I can, I'm still making choices in terms of what I put in the picture, but I find it so much more difficult. I I, I am much more of a studio painter. I'm okay. Plain air. I can, I can do a decent painting that way. It just does not suit my nature. Mm -hmm. I'm much more of a studio painter. I like the privacy of the space. I like to imagine what a picture can be. And within those walls with no one looking, that's where the images are made. There's there's a secrecy, there's a, a privacy, and I'm free to fail, to explore insecurities, anything. And then I can come out of there with this sort of picture and say, okay, this is, this is, you know, the product of these hours of yeah, whatever that- happened in there, right? <laughs> whatever happened in there. This, this is the product telling- of what happened when I, when in my seclusion. <laughs> so it, it really does depend on me there. Like I said, I get influenced in different ways. Sometimes it's something written. Sometimes it's words. Sometimes it's an idea. Sometimes it's a, a, an actual space that I feel obliged to try to relive. And I think memory would play into that a lot. Other types of memory that happen in the studio, you're you're definitely, one of the reasons I like paintings that take forever to to make is that you're spending time thinking about those things. Mm -hmm. Whatever the the core of those ideas or whatever is drawing you to make this thing, you need to spend time figuring out what that is. Not just visually, but like psychically, psychologically. And the hours that it takes to do this, your mind is doing that. It's replaying these tapes, these experiences that you have, these paintings that you've seen in art history that you feel connected to. All of that's playing together in this space. And I mean, that's, that's why it's really why I love painting is that I get time to sort of sit there, take the personal experience of the people I've met, the places I've been, take the historical paintings that I've seen, the art history, take the things that I've read from different thinkers or music that I've heard, all of that sort of there playing around. 
as I'm working on this image Mm -hmm. and it comes up and it, you're like, yes, this makes sense. This is perfect. It ties in. Sometimes it doesn't, but you're spending time devoting your focus to some of the most important things in your life that you've experienced. And, you know, art, I consider the finest human achievement when we go to museums or when we read novels, it makes me proud to be a human. So when I'm in the studio, even though I can be utterly miserable and not be able to do what I am in that process, those things are coming together and you're never sure how they're going to get in there. So it's just in that process, being alone, going through, drawing this, mapping this thing out, trying to create this little story. All those things come jumping back. Yeah. And so you do feel like you're in this room full of all these people from history, from your life, everything else, and all of that sort of floating around you. Yeah. I love that. I love everything that you just said, by the way. I'm just sitting here going, it's awesome. <laughs> I think that's one of the biggest maybe misconceptions about about being an artist is that friends and, and relatives who are not artists often ask me like, don't you get lonely? Don't you? How do you spend so much time? Like, for me, I'm like, <laughs> like, kind of like you said, you have all of these people in there with you that are, are communicating and talking to you. And, you know, it makes us sound a little bit crazy, but fine. Artists are crazy. I don't care. It is the least lonely place for me in my studio. It is the most active and exciting place for me to be anywhere. <laughs> And I think that's what makes artists different is that we are excited about and willing to spend that time experiencing that, building that ability to be by yourself, think deeply about what it is that you're doing and how it, you know, like what you're creating and bringing into the world, which makes it, you know, that's where the loftiness of art comes in. It gets a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's it goes without saying that it's it's easy to fail miserably in in that pursuit but in the the good moments of painting you feel utterly connected to all that stuff. Yeah. When it works out it translates and and maybe other someone else picks up on that or feels connected. But I think one of the things you said about you know, sort of being alone or or people saying, you know, don't you get lonely? Yeah, you get lonely, but you're, yeah, you're not alone at the same time. But I think the other thing that's really important about art, particularly today, I think painting is that it does continue to communicate when we were talking about like the substance of paint, the skin of paint, when you're applying it, the different layers, the, if you're sensitive to that, there is something happening when you're sitting in front of a painting and you are taking that in and you're processing it. Even if you can't always explain exactly what's being communicated, you can feel it. And I think it's very important today for people to realize that there are these alternative ways of communication and that there are ways of communicating that are not immediate. It's not immediate gratification. Sitting in front of this painting for hours and hours, it continually emits information and connections. And the longer you spend with that thing, the better chance you have of like picking up on what it has to say. Mm -hmm. But I think because there are so many things that are accessible through technology, and there are great things about it. The fact that I can talk to you, you know, this easily and see you, it's those are wonderful things. I've met so many interesting people through social media and and email and everything else. Uh, I think that's, that's wonderful. But the I think the story that gets told is is always the the most popular story. It's like what mm. does the bulk of society think and that becomes the standard. I think it's very important to show that there are all sorts of communities, ways of communicating, ways of making connections that are outside of that norm that are not easily understood that are continuing to be made. I feel like in this time period that's incredibly important because it's the social pressure today is very, very strong because we have access to it. Mm. So people showing that there are other ways to communicate and, and taking the time to do that. If you think about, you know, a painter or a writer, how much time they take to actually create this little thing on a wall. 
Yeah. It can seem utterly absurd. But if you're one of the people that have been moved or your life has changed sitting in front of a painting, it's worth it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, I, I, I feel like there is this whole hidden underworld of, of people that communicate, you know, I think musicians. All of the arts. Yeah. They're picking up on all sorts of things. So uh, I think it's very important to sort of let people know that that stuff is out there. Yeah. It's this kind of fascinates me and frustrates me at the same time. Sure. But we do sort of live in this world now where it's it's sort of the perpetual sound bite. And whether that's a snap of your iPhone photo or, you know, you're just saying something really quickly. I have, like I mentioned, I have friends who are not in the arts whatsoever, not connected and almost have no interest in it at all. <laughs> and so that gives me a very, to me, it's a very fascinating perspective. I know they get very frustrated with me when I say, no, I'm painting and when I say I'm painting, like I am not available this entire weekend at all. <laughs> yeah. And, and to them, that's just, you know, when I, I think in their heads, when I say I'm painting, it's like, okay, well, she'll be gone for, for an hour or two. And I have to constantly be like, no, I'm talking a weekend, at least probably a couple of weeks, I'm going to be working on this. And when I'm in it, I'm in it. <laughs> and so like, I don't know, it's really hard for me as, um, you know, I'm sure Lots of artists deal with this differently, but that getting deep inside of it and then having to pull yourself out for like a two hour dinner to me, is just like, I'm no, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's a constant struggle, but it's also so fascinating to me, the reactions that I get and understand, you know, trying to bring myself into that other perspective and, and go, yeah, they really, it is special for artists to be able to dive into something and spend an hour a week, a month, completely engrossed and happy, you know, relatively happy. There's lots of roller coasters up and down of frustration and failures within that time period, but just absolutely dedicated to bringing this thing to fruition. Yeah. I, I think it's important to find enough people that have similar needs or interests, you know, yeah. that having that community because society doesn't want you to paint. No. I mean, they may like what you painted, but the work that sort of goes into it, it's it's good to be around enough people that value yes. that pursuit and allow you the time to do it. it yeah, it's definitely yeah. not easy. There's always a lot to balance and that sort of stuff. But, but I think it's also really important to not isolate yourself by only being around other artists or people who understand that sure, because I sure. think you, you lose, you lose touch or you lose ability to communicate with the rest of the world. <laughs> As my, yeah. and, and I will be the first person to say that my preference is to only communicate with artists. So it is sometimes like I, you know, I have to force myself to like go out and not be with any other artists. One of my greatest joys, I, I teach at a university, Sacred Heart University, mm -hmm. and being around colleagues in different disciplines, I really, really enjoy. I love being around artists because you can, there's a common ground, you can talk, but there, there are the sort of similarities uh, between artists that you only get a certain type of conversation. Mm -hmm. Being at the university, I've had amazing encounters with some of my colleagues in English and history and religious studies, philosophy, theology, Spanish. Love it. I really get my mind really sparks and my yeah. spirit sparks because these people, these are people that believe in um, the liberal arts. They believe in the arts. They know more than just their own discipline, but they're yeah. coming at it from a different perspective. I really enjoy that stuff. My wife's an art historian too. And even that slight difference in terms of the way that, of connecting with a, a piece, we have tons of overlap, but I, I will almost always visually immediately sort of go to an image and read it visually first and then start deconstructing going it. into other, other things. Yeah. And she's definitely looking at it more from like a cultural perspective in terms of, you know, why was this art made by this culture during this time? What are the different forces that are creating this object? So that's also been 
very beneficial and exciting to me. Oh, gosh, yeah. That's, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of funny, because, you know, when I say things like that, it's, it's the transition from pulling myself out of my art world and going into the other part that I don't like. It's kind of like some people like it, having painted, like they like the outcome versus the yeah, process yeah, yeah. of doing it. And so it's, yeah, it's that push and pull is, it's there. And it's, to me, it's really interesting. But I think, like you're saying that those conversations that you have with your colleagues, and I mean, I, the university environment, I miss that a lot that you have these people who are equally dedicated to their part of the world as you are to yours and to be able to talk to somebody that is so passionate and just so in, you know, you pick up their passion you and you see things differently and you, ex and you experience, you know, theology and, you know, all these other things that you get to have this, this view into that I think only enriches and expands your art world. So I think that, you know, pulling yourself out and having these conversations, whether, I mean, whether it's in a university environment or on the street is so important. And to talk mm -hmm. to people from other disciplines, I think is critical to growth as an artist. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, I'm talking a lot, but this is, this has been an amazing, a very, very interesting conversation. And I, I would I really want to continue it, but I have another call that I'm actually late for. <laughs> no problem. I'm like, I'm having a hard time cutting this conversation out. I was like watching the clock going. <laughs> But yeah, less just, you know, real quickly, can you talk just a little bit about what you're working on now, what you're currently obsessed with, what is on your, your easel? There's a lot going on. So I, I'm trying to finish up. There's a figure drawing I've been working on, but I got a grant to do a, like a time-lapse video of a long pose figure drawing. So I'm trying to do something that's about 40 hours long. Oh, wow. I teach figure drawing, but the opportunity isn't there to sort of understand what do you do with the drawing after the 10 hour mark, you know, and I don't always have that opportunity to sort of teach. So I'm trying to film the process and I'm going to try to say things over the top of it. So I'm finishing that right now, but other things on the wall, there's a couple of really big narrative pieces. There's a big tondo that's has sort of like a Moses type figure. There's it's very sort of collage. There's a lot of things going on. And then there's a, a very big, like 14 feet by seven feet war painting that I started maybe two years ago or two and a half years ago. And I've put in chunks of time and got it pretty far along, but it still has a long ways to go. So I'm sort of looking forward to getting back into that. There are some smaller pieces that I'm sort of playing around with the idea of a mask. I had someone pose for some photos and I was trying different things. And I had a piece of tin foil that I had him stick over his face. And it did very interesting things. I bet. You could still tell it was a face, but it was highly reflective. So there's colors everywhere. And I got really interested in the sort of marks that the foil is making. It's creating these planes. They're reflecting colors in different parts of the room. So I have a few of those paintings going it's at the very beginning it's always dangerous to talk about stuff at the beginning but i have a few of those going so yeah there's there's a lot of different things going on i i i tend to like more than less so i'd rather sort of overwhelm myself with stuff to do uh -huh. that way there's always something to do yeah good call nathan thank you so much this was a great conversation yeah yeah thank you Thanks so much, Andres. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode with Nathan Lewis. And I want to give a special thank you to Jeremiah Polachek for introducing me to Nathan. Thank you, Jeremiah. You were right. It was a great conversation. Go to SavvyPainter.com for show notes on this episode and to see examples of Nathan's paintings and how to connect with them. And while you're there, make sure you don't miss an episode of the podcast. Sign up for show updates and free guides at SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. 
Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists push through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening.